Um, we're going to be looking, uh, continuing our series, looking to God's Word. So if you do not have a Bible, we have um, our ushers who are just going to make a, make their rounds. If you can put your hand up, these have been uh, disinfected, so uh, they're COVID-free. And uh, we can make sure uh, you have a Bible as we go. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 5. So if you would open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 5. And uh, let's stand for the reading of God's word. Revelation chapter 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll with its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain! to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. You can be seated. You can put up your umbrellas. And we're going to pray. Father, as we gather here, longing for the break in the clouds, not just right now, but eternally, we pray that your word would go forth and together we ask for a fullness of your spirit that you would work through your word proclaimed in just the ways we need. We pray together in Christ's name. Amen. The pain, the injustice of this world is too much for our hearts to bear. If you, if you read a, maybe a book or, or watch a movie that just kind of captures a little bit of, of the pain of this world, that can cause our hearts to swell and be full. But when you know the young man who's being sent to prison, who has dealt such a terrible hand that it seemed like this path was impossible to escape, when you walk with that addict who, who wants to break free 
but whose past trauma and hurts grip so tightly. When you're in the mire with somebody whose toxic family of origin makes it so difficult to walk in this life, it causes our hearts to break. But these aren't isolated incidents. This is story after story after story. It's pain after pain after pain. If our hearts could, could feel it, 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 would, it would be too much. We couldn't bear it. Our body and our minds carry wounds. Wounds that are deep and lasting. Wounds of abuse. Wounds of untimely grief. Wounds of exposure to inappropriate sexual things. Wounds of a spouse who has damaged us. Wounds of a dysfunctional absentee parent or a volatile household. And it makes our hearts break. It's so much to bear up under. And even for us, even for us who, who have known the, the freedom that the gospel brings, these wounds, these wounds can cause our hearts to be heavy, our steps to be hard. Our, our world is hope-stealing. Our world is dark. We long for whole relationships and yet it seems like we can't accomplish them. We see injustice continue and it goes unanswered. Governments and leaders fail us. Heroes are toppled from their pedestals. And even other Christians let us down. This isn't just out there. It's the stories of us in here. I know we probably would prefer not the rain, but in a sense right now with what we're talking about, the rain is the right emotion of the sky. But against this backdrop, Against this backdrop of the pain and brokenness of this world, Revelation gives us a vision. A vision of a God, a mighty God who sits on his throne. It's there in chapter 4. Picking up at verse 2, John says, At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne there was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which were the seven spirits of God. And before the throne... There was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. What a glorious picture. We feel like if we could just get our eyes off of the kind of brokenness, the crud of this world, and onto his glory, onto that throne room, wouldn't that be glorious? But yet it leaves us with a question. If God sits up on the throne like that, why is our world like this? If there's this God who sits enthroned with 24 smaller thrones with thunder and lightning bolts around him, 
Why the wounds and pain and brokenness and injustice of this world? But chapter 5, verse 1, answers that question. Because he said, John says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll with it written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Now, if you're familiar with the book of Revelation, you know what this scroll represents. It's kind of a, a scroll of destiny, a scroll that unfolds God's saving plan. So there's these seven seals on it, and, and in Revelation, you see each of those seven seals broken. And when the seventh seal is open, then you hear these seven trumpet blasts. And as those seven trumpet blasts are sounded at the t sound of the seventh trumpet blast, you hear about these seven bowls, seven bowls of wrath that are poured out. And these interlocking seven, seven, seven really form the structure of the whole book of Revelation with different stories of God's mounting, the mounting conflict between the world and God uh, intermixed. But, but these sevens form the story of Revelation, the story of God ushering in his perfect kingdom. And so when we see God on his throne, not just sitting there kind of aloof, not just sitting there with his, you know, rainbow around him saying, oh, those poor plebes down on earth in their agony. No, this is a God who holds a scroll. It's the scroll that takes the vanity of this world and gives it meaning. It's the scroll that takes the darkness of this world and gives it light. It's the world that takes the, the rain and storms of this world and brings sunlight. It's the, it's the scroll that takes the weeping of this world and replaces it with joy. The sin and brokenness of this world and replaces it with righteousness. And so in verse 2, when we hear the mighty angelic voice saying, Who's going to open it? Our hearts skip a beat. Who is it? Let's get this scroll open. We are longing for this, are we not? But it all changes in an instant. Verses 3 and 4. And no one in heaven on, or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. What does it say John did? I began to weep loudly. Because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. This is an important moment in the story. John weeping because he believes there's none worthy to open the scroll. If the scroll's not opened, this world continues in its present state forever. And so John weeps. Hear me. If we do not weep with John at this point, we will not worship with the angels later. If we don't know the weight of the agony of this world and weep for it apart from Christ then our gospel hearts will never grow and develop like they should. If we're able to stand aloof and removed from the pain and agony of a world apart from Christ, then our growth as Christians will either be stunted or perhaps we may even be fake Christians. We must feel the pain of the blight of this world. We must put on the, the garb, the weeds of widowhood and mourn. If you are here this morning and you are feeling the pains of the brokenness of this world. If the rain is just right for how you're feeling this morning. Know here that God has put in this moment to hear the weeping because that is the very heart of God for the state of this world. 
There's an old Jewish song that says, Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Psalm 30. And John's weeping tarries. But as God promised, it does not have the final word. As God promised, the weeping ends. And so we hear in verses 5 and 6, or verse 5 I should say, And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll with its seven seals. The lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, promised in Genesis 49, has come. God's kingdom is coming. The, the great branch of David, that root of David, the conquering king promised in Jeremiah 33, it's coming. He's conquered. The scroll can be opened. What glorious news. And then as we hear this news, something surprising happens. We turn to look to see who this lion is, who this conquering king is. And what John sees, according to verse 6, is a lamb standing as though it had been slain. The mighty lion is a slain lamb. The, the conquering Davidic king is a bleeding sheep. Yes, yes with seven horns representing a certain amount of authority and or perfect authority and reign. Yes, with the seven spirits representing the whole and complete spirit of God that dwells within him, but nonetheless a slain lamb. What, what's going on with this imagery? Lion, conquering, Davidic king, slain lamb. It doesn't make sense. It's meant to get our attention. Because it's, it's, it's begging the question, why? Why is this, this, as we know Jesus, worthy to open the scroll? Why does he need to be a slain lamb to be the conquering king? And that is precisely the question that the, the 24 elders and the four living creatures then answer for us. You know, commentators and casual readers alike say, okay, what are those 24 elders supposed to represent? Who are these four living creatures? And they're, they're valid questions, but they actually here answer a more important question for us. And look how they answer why this, this lamb is worthy to open the scroll in verses 9 and 10. Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals for, for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on the earth. Jesus has done two things, it says. He's ransomed a people from every tribe, tongue, and language. And he's made them into a kingdom, priests who will reign on the earth. Now, in order to understand what, why this is such a big deal, we have to understand a, a little bit about how God's kingdom works. This, this mighty God who, who sits on his throne with peals of thunder and, and flashes of, of lightning and, and blazing torches could at any time come and just wipe out this rebellious earth that has said, we'll do it our own way, God. We don't need you. He could bring his judgment at any time. He doesn't need the, the bleeding lamb in order to open those, those kind of, that kind of destiny. 
God is just, and he must punish sin. But God does more than just mete out justice. God is about more than just dispensing justice. God is about establishing in this world, or establishing, not in this world, but eternally, God is about establishing a beautiful, perfect kingdom, the best possible world. God's heart is, is for the, the, the goodness that he knows, the joy he experiences to be shared with his people. And so he is establishing a perfect and eternal kingdom that will last forever, that is better than any world you can imagine. But if we rebels are going to be able to be part of that eternal kingdom, which is his heart, then, then a few things have to happen. We must be ransomed from our sin. And we must be made into a new people that are fitting for that kingdom. If, if rebels to the crown were allowed in that kingdom, it would be unjust. And if rebels to the crown like us were allowed into that kingdom, we'd spoil it. So God needs to come and he needs to do something about our sinfulness and pay that penalty. He needs to deal with the, the just wrath we deserve. And he has to make us new. So a few weeks ago, we saw in Romans 3 how he does the dealing with our sin. He, he, we saw that we are justified, made right with God through his atoning sacrifice, through what Jesus did on the cross when he ransomed us, paid for our sins. And then a couple of weeks ago, when Terry preached from 2 Corinthians 5, we saw how God makes us a new creation. What, how, how he forms us, as Stephen put it last week, as people who want to swing that bat and hit the ball, who want to live as, king, as priests for our God. This is what Jesus did for us. So yeah, God could just mete out justice at any time and come and deal with this mess of the world. And Send us all to hell where we deserve. But that's not all God's doing. In fact, what, he, what he's ultimately doing is establishing that perfect world. And he wants, he wants us to be able to be a part of it. I don't know about you, but I long, I ache for that future kingdom. The pain and imperfection, the vanity and folly of this world makes me long all the more. And with each passing year, I long for it even more. But we don't, we don't deserve to be there. We've rejected God and his rule. We've insisted on our own self-rule. So we have no business being part of that kingdom. Except. Except. Except for what Jesus has done. In being the slain lamb. In paying the ransom. So have you embraced Jesus? Jesus. Have you chosen to follow this Jesus and receive what he offers? The Genesis 49 line of Judah, the Jeremiah 33 branch of David conquering is also the Isaiah 53 lamb that was slain for our sins. The whole of the Old Testament comes together in Jesus who comes and by means of his atoning work makes a way for us. Our sins are forgiven so that we can be restored to our Heavenly Father and restored to that relationship. His Spirit comes in and dwells us and makes us new all because of the work of Jesus on the cross. Run to Jesus. Know the life he provides. 
And when we do, when we know that, what is our response? Our response is to worship Jesus. Our response is to say, this Jesus is worthy. He's worthy to open the scroll. He, he's worthy to usher in that perfect kingdom. He's worthy to, to take this blighted world of ours and make it his own fair world again. And the worship starts with those 24 elders and those four living creatures saying, worthy is the Lamb. But it radiates out from that epicenter in heaven to encompass the whole host of heaven who are gathered around that throne saying, worthy is this Jesus. Worthy is this Lamb for what He's done. And as it is in heaven, so it will be on earth as that heavenly worship extends to all the earth the creation that in Romans 8 was groaning and longing now, now gathers together to say of, of the God who sits on the throne, God the Father who sits on the throne, and God the Son, the slain Lamb, who stands there with Him, reigning together to say, worthy are they to receive blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Once we weep with John, we see the glory of Jesus and what he's done, and we worship with the angels. If you here this morning are weeping, it tarries for the night, but joy comes in the morning. The clouds we so much dread will one day break and pour blessings on our head. So let us be a people who worship this great Jesus who has rescued us from the pain of this world, who takes the world that's dark and tries to steal our hope and says, No, I have conquered. The Lamb that was slain is the conqueror. And when we praise Him, the four living creatures say, Amen. And the elders fall down and worship. Let's pray. God, thank you for this word. I pray that we would weep over the agony of this world like John. I pray that we would see what Jesus has done and run to him. And I also pray that we would give you the worship you're due. Not begrudgingly, but because we see how glorious it is what you've done. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.